On this episode, we're going to talk about the digital transformation of sales and marketing. With so many different platforms, and their purposes evolving daily, navigating social media can be, well, complicated. Welcome to the Social Media Sucks Podcast from Cubco. Social media. Social media. Social media. Social media. Social media. Really sucks. Where we unpack the latest trends and help remove the suck from social media. Welcome back to the Social Media Sucks Podcast by Cupcake. You're If you're experiencing fear of missing out when it comes to social media and marketing trends, then this is the podcast for you. We help you level up your marketing and business skills by covering the latest topics in social media and through inspiring guests. Before we get started, do us a favor. If you're not already subscribed to our podcast or to our YouTube channels, please do it now. It really helps us get this amazing inspiration and education t- out to more marketers and business people like yourself. And uh, let's get into today's episode. So with me today is Henrik Spenden. Uh, and then, as always, our cowboy here, CEO, <laughs> yes, Chris Carbonis. I'm always here. Hi, guys. And so today we're talking about this digital transformation that's happened in sales and marketing since we have so much experience around the table here i love that you said experience that's good of course good. Yes. what else would i say yes, it's, good. <laughs> it's good it's good i do feel experience so. yeah exactly yes. so good. henrik let's start with you thank All you right. for joining us today thank you very much and can you please take us through your 30 years of experience within sales and marketing no definitely not <laughs> you don't have enough time because we don't have the time we don't have the time for that uh, can yeah. you um give us the highlights of what industries you worked in sure, and then sure. what have you gained along the sure. way yeah well uh i started my career in singapore when i was uh, 23 mm. selling distributing heidelberg printing machines okay yeah That's that was that was before the digital uh, revolution. I don't even know what that is. You don't even know what that printing is, machine right? Was printing machines. <laughs> yeah. Print? What? Offset what? print, yes, yeah. magazines. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, Singapore, Thailand, and the Philippines. How did you end up there? Like, what was the what was the catalyst for that? You just well, found I, a job there, and you're like, I really want to yeah, go to Singapore. Yeah. I, started, I started as an apprentice with a company which uh, used to be one of uh, Denmark's uh, biggest companies yeah. called East Asiatic Company. Okay. And that company hardly exists anymore. Yeah, mm. okay. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, one of the divisions was uh, graphic arts. So um, I was in that uh, division and uh, with the goal of, mm. uh, of uh, traveling and ending up somewhere nice. on the globe. I didn't yeah. know where. And uh, Just put a pin in the map. Mm-hmm. They put a so. pin on, on the map and I ended up in Singapore. Singapore. With print. For like uh, three, four years and uh, moved on to Manila for a couple of years and then to uh, to Bangkok. Doing what? Still print? Still or? selling graphic arts uh-huh. equipment, mm-hmm. okay. being in charge of, of that division. Yeah. And then uh, I moved on to, uh, to uh, Germany where I spent around 12 years in the fashion and lifestyle. Yeah. Industry. There's a big change. That mm-hmm. was a big change, yeah. but you know, people always tell you that in this country it's very specific, or yeah. you really have to, you know, do it differently in our region. But uh, no, not my so experience much. is that it's uh, pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. it's it's a lot. Of, it's a lot about people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, sales and marketing is uh, pretty much the same. Yeah, you have a lot of new buzzwords in marketing today yeah. but mm. uh, but the constant is humans essentially yeah, like, it is yes yeah. 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 and human so psychology it's still still the same mm. so i spent um 12 years in uh, in germany in the fashion and lifestyle uh, clothing one of the brands was peak performance i think that's yeah. uh, quite it's well still, known it's still here today yeah yes <laughs> moving on from from uh, wholesale to uh, to retail mm-hmm. opening up uh, own stores so within sales, I have been both in, in wholesale, B two B, and B two C. Interesting. Then I returned to Denmark and worked within a um, a, a digital uh, setup uh, in the year two thousand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had the first dot com uh, bubble at that time. Yeah. And I was working for a um, a company called Haburi dot com. Okay. In uh, those days, and that was a uh, company uh, selling, distributing um, off-season 
uh, clothes and apparel. Okay. And uh, okay. so so the dual value proposition, as that was the word I I learned in those days, <laughs> uh, was that it was uh, you know a benefit both for the uh, for the brand owners and also for the consumers. Yeah. Mm. It was before we had the the big uh, factory outlet centers around okay. the world. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, just some numbers uh, from from those days. Our I learned the word uh, customer acquisition cost. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the customer acquisition cost at that time for for one customer was two hundred and sixty two thousand Danish kroner per customer. Per customer. Because uh, they're c- taking in all sales, all marketing, retail. We were shop. doing we were doing TV commercials. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the. The customer acquisition cost was uh, was a quarter of a, a million Danish, mm-hmm. and the cost for uh, for establishing the uh, the online shop, yeah. which was never really working. That's another story. Mm. Uh, was more than twenty million Danish. Okay. Yeah. That's a. That's so a uh, that was the uh, infant stage of yeah. uh, of uh, yeah. e-commerce. Mm-hmm. So, so the early days were sucky. Like it was. It yeah. Was, yes. Yeah, you really had to to invest well and almost like belief like almost like a mm. religious belief that this yeah. is going to right. pay off right, right? Mm. Yes. Uh, and that's why a lot of i think that's why you see a lot of laggards that didn't do it because they're like mm, let's make sure that this actually <laughs> pans out before we go and spend 20 million because yeah. that was the cost like it was, it was the cost crazy. and it was accepted and i was actually yeah. i joined the company in 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 the last uh period uh, of the company because uh, the burn rate as we also talked about uh, we had burnt like 160 million uh, danish uh, to set up the business just to get it going mm. and we were not calculating in uh, in sales and revenues we mm. were just uh, it was just about getting orders mm. and the transactional costs it really didn't matter mm. it was just about uh, Building brand, building the brand, there. getting hundred thousand orders uh, yeah. in one year. That was yeah. uh, that was it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I think a lot of startups are like that. I mean, that's why you see they're capital intensive at the beginning. Specifically, I think fashion. I mean, we're talking about digital transformation here. I think that's the biggest difference nowadays. Is that the, you know, everyone and their dog are starting up their own fashion companies because the the uh, barrier to entry is so much lower now mm. than it was 20 years ago yes where you had to have factory contacts and design contacts and distribution networks and and all of these other things that you mm. don't need today like you can kind of get mm. going you can even just white label off of somebody else's factory and design and mm-hmm. all that stuff so yeah it's uh, it's a much different setup now yeah. right? and at that time uh, we, we started hearing about a company called amazon who? That was the, yeah. <laughs> Chris's favorite website. Actually, it is my favorite world. website. I really <laughs> love it. I, mean, I do really love it. Sparkling his eyes when he it. I know, but it's, it's so like great. when dogs here like walks, they're just like. <laughs> they hadn't. They hadn't been in business for for many years at that time. So mm. that was one of the of the few benchmarks mm. we had. So yeah. so that was my my entry into the to the digital um, yeah. age in the year yeah. two thousand. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I've been been with that. Uh, followed that uh, since then. Interesting. For like uh, yeah, twenty two yeah. years. That's what great. are you doing now? Uh, I have uh, after I've been, uh, I was then um, I moved on to a, a few companies uh, in fashion lifestyle as mm-hmm. the CEO. Okay. Uh, Such mainly as? Uh, fashion jewelry mm-hmm. uh, and uh, luxury fur. Mm-hmm. I've also been uh, and I've traveled uh, around the world. My main focus has been as CEO has been uh, distribution sales uh, on an international uh, scale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. So, um, seeing the world, and uh, since yeah, well, for about twelve years, mm. I have I have my own um, consultancy company uh, within fashion and lifestyle, mainly focusing on international sales, uh, marketing, uh, yeah. and branding. Yeah, great. Interesting. Is, when you're working with customers or new clients within the fashion industry, is there a red thread of, of challenges that you see? Like, is there something that they come to you with? Almost everyone comes to you with and says, "This is the challenge," and you go, "Oh, that's you know, that's this." Or, or are they all very different? Or is there something that's sort of equal across everyone? I think uh, the challenges uh, have uh, have changed a lot uh, in the good old days, and that's not that many years ago. 
uh, it was mainly uh, about push, it was about distribution. How do I get into uh, Germany or Holland oh, yeah. or mm. whatever? Should I move on to China, uh, etc.? So that was very much about the distribution. Yeah. How do I do that? Uh, do I go the wholesale way? Do mm. I go retail, franchise? Uh, what should my sales channels be? That was yeah. the usual question. Yeah. And, okay. and and that uh, that has uh, obviously changed a lot uh, yeah. due yeah. to the digital distribution. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah. now everybody is focused on on uh, on online business and uh, yeah. online seen together with uh, offline distribution as a. As but that's a really interesting because um, let me hear you guys' experience on the industry transformation over the years. Let's just take off point in fashion and retail, for instance. Like, what have you noticed, Chris, within you know the brands you work with in this in in this field, and what have you experienced? What's the biggest transformation in like, the industry from a marketing standpoint, or yeah, from maybe, like yeah, I think maybe Henry can elaborate more on the sales well, part. Well, I think from the marketing standpoint, I've seen that it is. Uh, I mean, obviously, the invention of even faster fashion and um, sales in that way, and trend sales have sort of increased, and the I think the the idea of doing even more aggressive marketing for that particular season or for that particular launch has has increased a lot and mm. the the share of voice and obviously brands have used social media quite effectively fashion brands in particular they've been pretty good at at sort of maybe even being ahead of everybody and mm. sort of doing things a bit differently um, because it is a trend product in a sense then you get they, they tend to be a little bit more trendy but that's been my experience with them mm. um, so far well I think we we should split up uh, we should split it up into two collections uh, which could or product which could be one area mm. another one would be a distribution uh, and if we look at, at collections and if we start let's just say the timeline starts at year 2000 where where the online business starts uh, developing mm. uh, slowly and not that successfully. Mm-hmm. At that time, uh, uh, collections uh, used to be uh, typically uh, twice a year, mm. two main collections. Yeah. And um, then we saw companies like uh, Esprit, which used to be really dominating yeah. the market, introducing uh, up to 12 collections a year. So right. taking the, the trends from... Uh, from um, uh, from other industries like uh, the fast moving consumer goods mm. yeah. and looking at uh, figures like um, stock turn, yeah. which was not a subject no. in, in the fashion business. Right. Um, you sort of uh, just pushed on the responsibility to the retailer. Mm. You had a pre, uh, pre-sale collection, a sample collection, you sold it in, delivered the collection, sent the invoice to the, to the customer, to the retailer, and uh, you didn't really bother about the, whether the the apparel would would sell off, uh, would sell out. Mm. Yeah. So that has changed uh, extremely. So we have a, we have uh, more collections uh, a year. Now that has then changed in the f- in the past five years because of uh, sustainability right. and because of, of the circular. The way, now it's going the other way around. Yeah. Now we're talking about uh, not fashion. Now we are not looking that positively at the companies like H uh, and M right. and the way they introduce um, or Sarah having let's say 51 uh, new collection drops uh, ev- yeah. every year mm. so fast fashion is uh, is not that popular anymore but we, we really saw uh, that uh, most brands developed to start out with four collections a year and then maybe more yeah. and then the uh, the the brand owners uh, took more and more responsibility for the business. Uh, if they did wholesale, if they had a retailer in between, they started to introduce uh, NOS, never out of stock. Yeah. Mm. So not pushing 100% of the of the risk to the retailer, right? but actually carrying stock on their own risk, of course, of basic articles, which uh, wouldn't uh, go out of style, go out of style yeah. the, the black t-shirts, etc. Mm. So, um, so that... that uh, 
In terms of collections, we have I seen know, a lot of, of uh, <laughs> yeah. That's all I wear, really. Yeah, <laughs> no but now you also have to, you know, to flag whether it's uh, sustainable, uh, yeah. how it's produced. It is. Uh, it's fully sustainable. Right? Yeah. yeah. We, we don't have to talk I about it. I wear it for 10 years, so <laughs> it's like. And that's uh, that's also that's also a sustainable way of thinking that uh, you actually wear the stuff uh, for a long time. Mm. I want it to look vintage. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, you cannot see my boots today, but that's uh, a... That's, uh, a 10 year old MS uh, boots. Yeah. I've just had them um, resold uh, like uh, for the fourth time. Yeah, uh, okay. that's good. So yeah. that that's sustainable yeah. Yeah, business, uh, yeah. right? So um, isn't that the way it should be, right? Like you buying, well, that should be. I mean, obviously there's things that people want in their collection and fashion changes, obviously, you're not necessary. Yeah. But there's always these staples that you always, mm. you know, a nice, for guys, it's always like, yes. you know, some blazers, Basic some, you know, exactly. khakis, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're gonna have things that are pretty standard. I think women have it maybe worse. You guys have to change things quite a bit and like I don't know, know anything about women. Yeah. And in terms of and <laughs> woman I don't know nothing about woman. <laughs> okay. about women. Yeah. And in terms of collection, how the how the collections have developed, you also see a lot of second hand uh, uh, today, right? Yeah, That's uh, term, yeah. uh, also online um uh, yeah. second hand uh, yeah. uh, retailers mm, yeah. so that that's also new and yeah. it's uh, it's actually a good thing to flag that you bought something uh, second hand right yeah. yeah so in the past or like part of the distribution thing which i think is interesting that you sort of alluded to which is you know do you find that brands are coming back again full circle to being like they want to own their own site yeah, like they yeah, used yes. it kind of went like own our own site and then they realized oh shit that's not where people are they're actually on the amazons yeah, yes. the azos is mm-hmm. the the yeah. whatever sites right we're right. going to be there in yes. a big way and then they realize oh but we don't have any customer data and we're missing a piece of the puzzle here let's go back to having our own right, channel right. has that have you seen that or what's i what's have going i have as i've seen it and i've lived with it and worked work with it and again let's start uh, uh, in the year 2000 <laughs> yeah where we saw uh, the uh, the online uh, channel as as a new alternative channel uh, that of course had a lot of attention, uh, mm-hmm. but most people, uh, no, most brands uh, used to be in uh, in wholesale, mm. so mm-hmm. they were, were pushing the the risk to to the retailer. Uh, to the retailer, mu- yeah. to the multi brand retailer. So yeah. that was that was the usual distribution. If you wouldn't be a, a big a vertical right. retailer like H mm-hmm. and uh, H&M or Sarah, right. pushing and, it to magazine or Benetton or yeah. whatever. Okay. So that it used to be mainly a, a wholesale business. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the first thing we we saw uh, was that um, that many brands, uh, medium-sized brands, um, decided also to go into uh, business uh, to consumer or to to into retailing. Yeah. Uh, typically, either their own flagship stores or uh, franchise models. Mm typically franchise uh, abroad where you didn't have the local knowledge mm, yeah so a lot of the uh, concept stores were opened by by brands mm. in order to to get known because the problem obviously was that it was impossible to develop your brand mm. uh, i it could also ask store. you a question could you mention uh, one just just one international uh, brand without uh, own retail without their own retail um this does Balenciaga have their own retail? Yes. Do they? I don't think I've ever seen a store. I I, I used to mention one example, and but but that's that's gone as well. That was mm-hmm. Rolex. They didn't have it, uh, ah, but but then stores. they started oh. also. Yeah, they were selling through watch jewelers yeah. and watch yeah, stores. Exactly. And now they, so, yeah. but now they do have their own flagship. Right. So so but generally, yeah. let's say ninety nine percent. Uh, yeah. Would have their own retail yeah. stores in that's order true. to build the brands yeah. or. At least they would start to have uh, concessions, shop in shops with uh, department stores. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. So that's the only way to to be seen and to be in one uh, A locations. Yeah. And that was the challenge. That was uh, that was the transformation that uh, all streets across Europe or United States mm-hmm. or whatever they would look the same. It would be vertical retailers. Yeah. So the only way to really be known and be seen and to build the brand would be either to go into the department stores uh, with yeah. concession models, various models, or open up your own shops, either on your own or mm-hmm. with a franchise partner. Right. So that was that was a big change. Uh, and at that time, many of, of, of the brands, they learned the hard way that it's not the same thing to be in retail as it is to be in wholesale. Or if you are successful in wholesale, mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a retail concept. 
Right. Yeah, and retail is also, I think, yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of like seen as a sexy thing to deal with. You're like, oh, I get to have my own space and I get to do this and we can do, con and like you get into it and you realize, holy shit, this is a lot of work and so oh. much overhead that. And risk. And risk, and you're like, I got to sign a five-year lease to right. be in this goddamn, yes. I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Like, so, <laughs> but it is like that. Even if you're a big company, it's still like there's massive risk on the side of retail. And I think, um it's uh, it's interesting that some of that risk has gone away in some ways. Um, right. and then it introduces other risks, but that's. You know. But that was that was the big thing. Uh, the wholesale brands mm. they learned that uh, it doesn't mean that you can be a retailer, uh, no, a even though you're a good uh, good wholesaler and and the product range may be good for a multi brand environment. Yeah. But you need to have a completely different uh, collection uh, build up yeah. mm. uh, if you are in uh, in yeah. uh, and retail. your relationships change too, right? right. Like if you're right. a wholesaler and you're selling to multi tenant or multi sort of brand retailers, um, you've got to set up there where it's like here's the MRSP, here's this, here's that, and then if you go on your own side and start selling stuff direct, right? Then the the your all your sort of relationships they go well are you guys going to undercut us mm -hmm. what's going to be what is going to happen here when you guys have a sale do we have a sale like because we want to make sure that you know we're not damaging the brand across right. different mm -hmm. channels so that's also introduced when you start looking at your own retail so distribution wise it's like you know you have a triangle where on top you have your own concept shop uh, your profile shop mm. in the middle you have uh, concept corners or shop and shops with department stores etc and the bottom that's the main distribution that uh, would be uh, typically wholesale yeah into let's say a b or c retailers where you start to do some segmentation mm. and you can take exactly the same triangle and move that to uh, online mm. uh, because uh, that has then happened since let's just say the year okay. 2000 where where we started up uh, having our own uh, shop mm -hmm. Um, and at that time, we didn't really know was it was it a shop or was it mainly a a brand door where you showed the brands. Uh, right, right, yeah, yeah. Was what, what, uh, or could you do both? Yeah. Um, uh, was it for your for for your business partners or whatever? Right. And today we we see, of course, that it's uh, it's all e-commerce. Uh, but that yeah. at that time it was a little bit uh, fluffy. So uh, people started out opening up their own uh, stores and uh, or own web shops, and. Um, then it moved on to to the middle segment, the department stores uh, online. It's not called a department store online, but it's exactly the same. Uh, the Boost, the Salando, yeah. the uh, Amazon, uh, yeah. if, if that's the distribution you mm -hmm. want to go for. Uh, and that has become extremely uh, popular. Uh, yeah. uh, just like the department stores used to be extremely popular yeah. uh, mm. 20, sort 30 of years ago. become the department stores of... Online, if you want to put yeah. it that way, right? And so. then, and with the same argument, basically, that if you are a not that well-known brand, uh, if you are not represented in, let's say, Germany as a Danish brand, well, instead of opening up your own store and uh, losing a lot of money just trying to Amazon. do that, just go through Boost, or open up uh, uh, the the yeah. market online in mm. Germany, which is extremely competitive, well, go to the to the department store in Germany. In this case, it would be the online department store called uh, Zalando. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing uh, all about the uh, consumer behavior uh, in Germany, mm. knowing what sells well with your product, yeah. what the customer adds to the baskets, what uh, is expected, what yeah, needs to be so done. so much data you can retrieve now. Also because Chris mentioned that entry level is so low now, right? So right. I think there is also this shift within the brands that maybe you don't have to have a store it's a good way at least to tell to test your brand right and the sales to build up maybe so so retail. i could i could as a danish brand as an example i would choose salando uh, as a as a marketplace as, as a testing platform before i go to market in mm. in germany exactly. and i would even accept that i would do that at, at a minor loss mm. yeah. because i would build up a lot of uh, knowledge uh, it's the same thing with the department stores the physical department stores they have the traffic Salando, they have the traffic. Yeah. So same. you just need to place your product in a multi-brand environment. Mm. Yeah. Of course, in a branded way, so mm -hmm. that you can also select the the branded shop at Salando. Yeah. But you can also do so, do shopping uh, together with uh, a mix of other brands, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 
So, so that's, that's basically the trend. And if I look back at where have I been completely wrong in my predictions, uh, I used to, to say that um, wholesale, uh, uh, physical wholesalers, uh, they would, uh, that segment would die. It would all be taken over by, by change and uh, by the verticals. And uh, we wouldn't see any, any multi-brand, local multi-brand shops. Okay. But hey, uh, <laughs> look around and yeah. see. Of course, Still it's there. it's it's different. It's different yeah. shops. It's different concepts. It's new concepts. Uh, yeah. But uh, that business is is going pretty well. Still, yeah. right? Yeah, it's okay. And I think it's also, well, it depends. I think they they've had to change their business model quite a bit as well, and and sort of also look at how do you, you know how do you really capture foot traffic in, and also give an experience, right? I think department stores maybe previously were spending less money per square foot on nice displays and da, 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 like besides maybe the big ones like Macy's or something like that in the US. Whereas nowadays they really see it as like, okay, we need to, we need to have a Joe and the juice in here and we need to like have, you know, this and we got to have the music going and we got to mm-hmm. have like, and they've got to make it like an in-store experience every time you you but, come in. But you also need some incubators. You need also some young upcoming brands or labels mm. in that uh, environment, so that it's not uh, the same old, same all old. the same yeah. brands yeah. you see all over. Yeah. So, so that's that's one of the, the definite de- definitely one of the mistakes uh, I have made, and uh, some of the wrong <laughs> recommendations I've also given to to my clients that uh, I, I was firmly believing that um, wholesale selling wholesale that's not the way to build uh, your mm. distribution or your brand today in 2022 you see a lot of upcoming brands they are focusing only uh, on uh, on uh, doing wholesale. wholesale business really still isn't uh, that a, isn't that like indicative of sort of where we are in the world as well that there's many different models and a lot of them work it just depends on obviously like each individual brand's expertise in that area right. and how they do it and what they put into it. But essentially, like if you want to be all online, you can be all online. If you want to be retail wholesale, you can be retail wholesale. Do you want to be, right. you know what I mean? Like it really just depends on what you want to do and what you're good at. But I, th- I think also it has to do with the fact that uh, it, 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 it has become extremely competitive online business at the moment. So if, yeah. if I'm starting up a, 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 a small business, a startup, or if I'm a medium-sized brand, the the cost of being there, the, the cost of marketing, the cost of, uh, of, uh, of winning a customer, uh, the cost of being seen uh, mm. on social media, uh, on Google, et cetera, right, mm. has become extremely expensive. Yeah. So there's so, other costs surrounded by being online and yeah, not only in yeah, a physical space, right? right? It, it used it used to be pretty easy, but it has become uh, pretty tough. Mm. So if you don't have the the knowledge, if you cannot afford uh, an agency to help you with that, then um, wholesale uh, business is still is, is still uh, the way the <laughs> only way basically the only option uh, to yeah. to go. Yeah, if you don't have the ex- the in-house uh, digital marketing, social marketing expertise. Um, and maybe you don't have the, the branding or creative direction uh, stuff right. as well, then you really have to rely on those retailers to lift you up and, and to put you out there. Yeah. And, and so you have to sell wholesale. Mm. Where they are basically curating uh, your your brand, brand. right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and yeah. They're, they're sort of giving you a little bit of their brand. They're loaning exactly. their brand to yes. you for a little bit until you can build yours. And then maybe within three or four years, or depending on how sex successful you are, then you can start to look at, oh, should we in-house some of this? Should we do this? And, and so I think right. that's, uh, yeah, but you're right. I think that's a good model. Um, so okay. so you could you could say it's, so, so push, if we talk push and pull in marketing, push is still there. Yeah, right? absolutely. Mm. More than what I anticipated. Yeah. Mm. I, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think also, there's more room to push in a, I would say, more brand building way. Um, I actually had a conversation with one of our strategists, Andy, yesterday about this, that like so many things right now are branding. Like they're not, the push messaging are, are not like high conversion, buy this, buy mm-hmm. this now. Right. Everything seems to be 
branding yeah which softer. is yeah which is very very interesting everything's like okay we want to go entertainment we want to like inspire and and and, and sort of like you know really woo the customer mm. with with mm. these ideas and i'm like that's that's an interesting that's marketing having this impact i guess well it's marketing on, like kind of going back to old school yeah. stuff where it's like you know maybe not old school but like so this sort of 60s 70s sort of vibe which is very much like okay we're build the brand build a brand yeah. that's all we're doing build a brand yeah. build awareness build right. attention and then sales will will come like people will find you and if they yeah. if they buy into your branding then they'll buy into you mm. um which i think is very very interesting and it's also very challenging because branding is expensive like, yeah yeah and that's probably why you're seeing this sort of switch to more wholesale yeah. because they go yeah can can businesses learn anything post this COVID experience that's still going on, obviously in parts of the world, but doing, because that significantly changed physical and online experiences, right? Um, have you guys, can I have your input on that? Well, uh, I can, we can take one. Uh, Don't take us back to well, 2000. <laughs> no, I'll take you back uh, to the to the COVID, COVID, COVID period. <laughs> to the first in COVID. In March of 2019, I was in Singapore. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. Well, uh, let's take a, a retailer, no, well-known retailer in Denmark yeah. called uh, Bane. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have a, a lot of uh, shops and yeah. uh, they were doing quite well in terms of, of uh, online business, mm. but uh, they are, are well known for their physical multi-brand stores. And again here, I was predicting that uh, multi-brand would be out of business. Yeah. And uh, here we have a, a retailer being extremely successful with uh, offline uh, multi-brand retailing. Yeah. And uh, they decided um, during COVID, because their business was basically closed down, mm. to um, be more dedicated to uh, to the online business mm -hmm. and uh, they basically did what would take uh, five years they did that within uh, five months yeah. in terms of transformation mm -hmm. and um, and what they decided was that previously like online was following the marketing initiatives from from um, uh, offline uh, business yeah. so online just had to you know follow suit and uh, they just decided from one day to the other that now uh, online marketing is basically uh, running the show uh, yeah. and then driving driving the business mm. and then uh, the offline uh, activities uh, would just have to to follow suit yeah. so and that that has uh, that has basically caused the transformation for uh, a mainly uh, offline brick and mortar uh, multi brand retailer in, in Denmark uh, into being um, extremely successful yeah. with um, within online, but not just online sales uh, f uh, through their web shop or e-commerce shop, mm -hmm. uh, but also other areas uh, like uh, events, uh, online shopping events, which is also something which, okay, I can take you back to almost to Singapore now again. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> at least uh, uh, some 20 years ago, yeah. we, uh, we had something called TV shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember QVC, Q QVC yeah, for instance, yeah. which is uh, very well known uh, in 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 the U.S. and in yeah. in Canada, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, it was it was known as a, as a well, not an upscale distribution, no, not at all, but uh, but yeah. quite successful. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was this late night sort of like, okay, I need these knives <laughs> that can cut through my shoes. Exactly, give me yes. these knives that yes. cut every one of my shoes up. But I, I mean, when you I was didn't hit that wave, right? Uh, oh, I was Did I was you? I've been alive for that, but I don't think I ever yeah, but shopped you're, anything. You're a little bit too young. I was young too for young. That, right? I didn't have yeah. a credit card for that. But I mean, like if I did, I would. Probably that would be would've, dangerous. Would've been <laughs> but mom. anyway, t taking you back to those days uh, of of TV shopping, mm. we have the same. It's just uh, it's just online in, in, instead, mm. uh, yeah. which is uh, a growing channel. Uh, yeah. Which is also, if you take a banner as an example, mm -hmm. and many other retailers, they had to reinvent themselves uh, within. Uh, Within two weeks uh, yeah. during COVID, yeah. And uh, what what do we actually do with our with our um, uh, with our summer collection, which will be out of fashion in in, in three months? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we going to sell that? And they started to have live shopping, uh, and that was uh, developed from yeah from nothing to uh, to a very interesting uh, business. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see uh, a company like uh, like Boost. Yeah. They have just acquired a uh, a company within uh, live shopping. To also be part of that segment, yeah. if you look at um, at the retailer power, mm -hmm. 
they are doing extremely well in uh, within uh, live shopping. Yeah, we definitely see that trend here as well. Like uh, uh, we do a lot of TikTok business here, and TikTok live shopping is, of course, like been released to a few different partners. A couple of our clients actually have it, and and I mean that works extremely well also on Facebook. Um, live shopping there is working. Right. I just read a story this morning. I think it was from Elias.dk, where they went live within the first hour. They sold a hundred thousand Danish kron worth of product mm. in an hour, right. like yeah. just live Power shopping. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, doing a lot so, of that. And I think that that comes down to like it, it, we talked a little bit actually at the beginning, which is like humans. Like that is the constant right. yes. throughout this, and and humans like to see product they like to feel products just seeing it in the web shop mm. you know in these glossy photos it doesn't necessarily give you a real sense of what is right. this but still as soon as you, too still too too did too dimensional yeah exactly so when you come live with it you go hey this is you know shitty quality cameras like here's what it is here's the fabric here's the whatever it is here's the right. buttons here's the and people go okay that's interesting i like that let's, yeah. let's buy and, that and also the the local perspective uh, that's also something we, yeah. we saw during uh, COVID, mm. that you became more loyal to uh, the local community, yeah. spending the money and yeah, uh, supporting yeah, yeah. the local community. Yeah. That's also within live shopping. Like yeah. you see a lot of uh, yeah, low quality live shopping mm. events mm. being extremely successful. So yeah. it's not just the, the, big, uh, the big guys doing this, like right. the Boost uh, doing it in a very professional way. Yeah. Mm. But uh, the local retailer still has a, has a good chance uh, that uh, here's Linda showing the the latest yeah, uh, the yeah. address uh, and so on and uh, yeah, sure. that's also that, so that's a, that's a new sales channel mm. yeah. or it's an old sales channel like Compromise. TV shopping yeah. just uh, in into the online media instead yeah. of uh, yeah. of the TV. Yeah. yeah. What yeah, challenges sure. can there be when they, you do live shopping, even though it can be low quality or whatever, lo-fi? But have you seen any? success stories and then what's the challenges here as well well on the success side i can just tell you from a mechanic standpoint that mm -hmm. that uh the channels facebook instagram TikTok, whatever it is they are pushing the live thing and yeah. they also continue to like so for example if you just post something on your instagram feed the reach is going to be pretty low yeah right like but for instagram live they're notifying people mm. this person's going live so that's the that's kind of the only unless you turn notifications on that's kind of like the only thing that is really pushing you mm. to go and interact with the brand on social channels and this is across all facebook instagram yeah. youtube all that so that's an interesting thing from a mechanic standpoint is like mm. this gives you this puts you to the front of the line when it comes to attention yeah um so that's a success thing which i think is nice i think what i've seen is it's all over the map you have these really professional live streams that are like you know super done up qvc style like in the studio mm. and then you have these ones that are just this yeah just somebody with their iphone and they're like hey look at this lipstick and like mm. look at this mascara and look yeah. at this and they both succeed it yeah. works it's like yeah. what is going what on here it, it's yeah. like but i think it also comes down to personality i mean you really have to have a good yeah, I mean, tv personality mm. that's sitting there yeah. i mean we are it. in a professional setup making uh, this uh, podcast yeah. podcast yeah. right and um but you also have podcasts uh, with uh, a lousy quality yeah. or yeah, if, yeah. if you go to the b2b uh, portal linkedin yeah. where i'm doing most of of, of my uh, business uh, it is known that if you look too professional on a video people don't want to see it and if you have advertising and if you have a company logo on your video mm. uh, it's a no-go right yeah. so the more unprofessional it is <laughs> and the, the more the more uh, you shake with the camera yeah, and uh, so on yeah. the better it is the more personal it is you mm. show that you're a human being right yeah that's so interesting right or the way you yeah. you talk about stuff if you can see that the person is not really prepared but mm. he's passionate about or she's passionate mm. about something yeah. it works much better yeah, do you yeah. think it depends on the brand um, not the brand maybe the product itself i don't know is there some product that's you know more meant to be hi-fi and then some product that's like it only works uh, it depends if it's on the brand like i think yeah. like if you're b and o banging all of a sudden yeah, i yeah. don't think you want to go live with something that's a little half baked i think you want to go pretty hard and heavy with it bad in video but really good audio <laughs> And yeah, I think exactly. <laughs> That's a funny concept, actually. Like we should be like, hey, the audio is spot on with the bang and all of a sudden. But I mean, obviously, they're selling a visual products as well. But yeah. but I do think like it depends on the brand, and I think it also depends on the personality. I think 
you can kind of get away with a, a not so great host if you mm. have a little bit higher production quality and <laughs> then so that's you, what you, we do here yeah, <laughs> you can, yeah we lift the production quality i mean if so. you look at, at luxury brands like B O or prada or i used yeah. to be uh, be uh, selling luxury fur yeah that was before the industry was uh, closed down in in denmark yeah and i traveled around the world china japan korea uh, and also the us and uh, Live shopping can also be done uh, in in a brick and mortar environment, because uh, personal shopping is is mm. uh, most of uh, luxury sales today yeah. is actually done uh, on a personal shopper level. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's the main sales channel in Japan for top luxury brands. Because somebody sends somebody else. Out that's there, uh, that's right? done with a personal shopper yeah. from the department stores. They have uh, 260 department stores in, in Japan. Yeah. And um, uh, <coughs> the lady from the customer uh, will go with a, with a personal shopper to this uh, shopping event, typically at a hotel, yeah. and buy her luxury stuff at, uh, at this hotel event, okay. or at the Danish embassy or whatever. And uh, I have done trunk shows uh, within the luxury business, so I travel with my 20 luxury furs uh, across the pond and uh, got through customs uh, and uh, did three days at um, Saks Fifth Avenue in uh, in Chicago, in, uh, in uh, New York uh, and um, in Houston. Yeah. They sell a lot of fur in Houston. <laughs> uh, well, I, that was a, that was the first question I asked when yeah, I got yeah. in when I got into the first studio, uh, yeah. and it was uh, pretty hot outside. Yeah, and uh, I said, do, "Do you sell fur uh, here in Houston? We sell fur all year round." <laughs> 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 I don't know what that means, but it, I like it. And, and that, that, that is personal shopping, yeah, just yeah, okay. in, in a physical environment uh, yeah. where uh, the, the, the personal shopper will call mm. up uh, uh, his or her customers and say, hey, I just uh, got in this uh, crazy Dane with uh, some luxury furs, hand produced, blah, blah, blah. Uh, come and yeah. see. I have reserved one model. I know it will fit you very well. And this uh, rich lady comes in and... Uh, she yeah. would buy the fur. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of different sales formats. Yeah. And, and I mean, those ideas, uh, those initiatives uh, are now coming true also on uh, online, online medias like yeah. uh, like TikTok, right? It's just yeah. another target group than yeah. the old lady in Houston. But, mm. uh, yeah, maybe not. Like and and we, we actually, we, are watching TikTok. <laughs> we, we, I also did the events at the Danish embassy in, in, uh, yeah. in, uh, in uh, Japan. Mm. And... Uh, these uh, very old ladies would come and, and we always discussed would uh, she had like 22 first at home, right? Uh, and, uh, she really need a new one. <laughs> was, yeah, but that was not, does she really need a new one? That was not the question to no. ask. It was, it was rather, would this be her last fur? Oh, oh no. <laughs> well, that's, that's not, a, that's a, yeah, when you're that age, it's like, that's a... She can pass it on. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, I guess, it's, <laughs> sustainable. Yes, but this be your last fur. <laughs> this would be the last fur you own. That's like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a bit scary. But yeah, so that a lot of sales formats and a lot of these are being transformed into... Uh, to digital, digital platform, yeah. digital yeah. platforms. Right. It's just that constant is human, yeah. the human constant mm. that yes. goes through, right? right? What would you guys then, uh, this, this might be my uh, last question, depends on what, uh, what do you <laughs> elaborate on? Did, you, did question? you ask any questions <laughs> at all? <laughs> right? yeah. 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 Okay. Um, what would you guys advise then the marketers out there um, to better utilize digital nowadays? Uh, what would I advise mm-hmm. to better use digital? Okay, it's hard when you do generalizations. In fashion, but in, in, fashion. in fashion, in fashion, I can limit that down. I think that there's two methodologies, right? There's like the chain types, which are like fast fashion mm-hmm. that need to basically pump out tons of content, tons of ideas, tons of ways of working. Mm-hmm. Or there's the more sort of big push style, which is more going back to campaign style, which is like we want to do something really brand mm. building, really interesting and go that way. And I think that um, my advice would be to find which one works best for you. Do you want to be always on content, engaging with your community, building a brand that way, using a lot of user generated content? Mm. Or do you want to be the other way, which is probably more like bigger campaign? Yeah 
bolder ideas sort of thing. So yeah. you just have to kind of choose yeah. which direction you want to go and, and sort of own it and stick yeah. with it. And um, you're not locked in for life. Right? No, like you can always media, change it up. You can always like, change it, but yeah. try something, right? And but stick at least to tr it a while. try a methodology that sort yeah. of works for you. And then I would say like, you need to invest in brand building and you need to invest in, in you know, social channels just on their own won't do it. You need to explore other ways. You need omni to channel. Like, yeah, you need to look at omni channel. You need to have an idea of how do you do like online, how do you do like a live stream thing, but how, how do you also like do in-store stuff and how do you do mm -hmm. like physical stuff? Because you need to look at what's working and what you, what do your customers actually want? Yeah. yeah. I think, um, my advice would be to understand the the toolbox of uh, omni-channel mm. retailing and um, to um, engage in, in understanding uh, showrooming and um, web rooming. Yeah. And these two um, trends, uh, how they uh, mix into each other and how they support each other where uh, showrooming is um, is a trend where consumers uh, visit the stores to uh, touch and feel uh, mm -hmm. the products, mm. uh, but up to purchase them uh, online. Yeah. And uh, web rooming is uh, the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, and that those those two concepts are basically a, a result of shipping uh, shifting consumer habits, right? So um, I think it's important to understand that uh, offline and online uh, work together. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes uh, it you may not see the results in in the uh, online store in terms of your investments because uh, it could be that uh, the results would show off in your uh, in your brick and mortar shop. True. Yeah. And um, without going too much into detail but uh, a lot of uh, of um, uh, studies have have been made and it shows that um, uh, consumers are likely to look at a at a product uh, online and buy it in store. Yeah, that that's mm. rather than the, yeah. like rather the than way. the other way around. Yeah. And of course, there are different uh, parameters. Yeah. Uh, why are people buying offline? Why are people buying online? But don't underestimate the power of uh, both being uh, online mm. and being uh, offline. Yeah. And don't get uh, frustrated if you don't get the sales results on one of the platforms. Right. Yeah. If there's a spillover effect uh, mm. from one of the initiatives to the other channel, that's fine. Mm -hmm. How you measure it, that's another story. That's a difficult part. That's a difficult it. one, yeah. right? So that that would be. Um, and again, here you see the big uh, the, you see the big uh, 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 onliners, whether it's. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, Amazon, it's uh, Boost, uh, they all built their brick and mortar shops as yeah. well, right? Yeah. So so uh, even onlineers we thought would be completely only online, mm -hmm. they're also going brick and mortar. Yeah. That's something yeah. I didn't uh, anticipate. anticipate at yeah, all, right? So, so, yeah. so It's coming full circle, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's full circle. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good so. uh, expression. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Let me summarize this episode for you. We talked about the transformation of sales and marketing over the years, and we can see that the previous challenges in fashion and jewelry industry were expanding markets and growing sales internationally. And now it's actually transitioning from wholesale, multi-brand retailer to own flagship store or franchise models with local knowledge. So this helps brands with getting access directly to their customers. What businesses can learn from the COVID experience is that the marketing strategies have shifted from physical to digital within the fashion industry. Attracting customers has changed from applying a push model to taking a brand approach, a branding approach. So in today's world, brands focus on making people buy into your brand by inspiring, inspiring information or entertaining them. And that will eventually bring in your customers. So more soft KPIs. So the ways that we sell has changed. For example, with live shopping, both professional and unprofessional lo-fi content can work. So in fact, the more um, lo-fi it is, the more personal it can seem. And within the luxury fashion, personal shopping has also developed a physical to digital platform, including live luxury shopping with a personal shopper, for instance. So the last advice we have for uh, marketers in fashion is go for always user-generated content or 
big bold campaigns to build your brand. You can pick up your strat you can pick your strategy direction and Chris's advice is to invest and build your brand. And then of course Hendrik mentioned that we have to understand the toolbox of omnichannel retelling. So engage in understanding both web rooming and show rooming and then how the trend mix and support each other due to customer shift in habits with the use of off and online. As a brand, you need to understand how these work together. So lastly, don't underestimate the power of both being present online and offline. So here you have it. Thank you guys for tuning in and stay tuned for the next one. See you guys. Bye. This has been the Social Media Sucks Podcast. <laughs>